This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to Hi guys, warm welcome to the YouTube channel IELTS with Praveen Khanna. Don't forget to visit playlists for videos on grammar, IELTS reading, IELTS listening, writings and other useful activities. Bye-bye. Best of luck for your exam preparation. You will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part 1. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between a student looking for accommodation and a university accommodation officer. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Student Services. Hello. Is that the Accommodation Office? Yes, it is. How can I help you? I'm trying to find a place to live. Can you help me, please? Are you with the English Language School? Yes, I have enrolled in a course that starts in four weeks. Well, we can offer you three types of accommodation. Do you know what you're looking for? No, I don't. Can you tell me what the different types are, please? Yes, certainly. The main types of accommodation are halls of residence, student flats, or homestay. Oh, I see. Can you tell me about the halls, please? Let me see. The halls of residence are about 20 minutes' walk from the campus. They cost £60 per week. It's self-catering only, and there's a minimum stay of 40 weeks. My course lasts eight weeks, so this is more than I need. What else did you say you have? Well, there are student flats owned by private landlords. These can be a few miles from the university. They charge a minimum of £75 a week, and you may need a deposit as well as a reference. This might be difficult for me. What about homestay? I've heard of it, but can you tell me more about it, please? These are family homes and cost from £100 to £150 per week, with a minimum stay of four weeks. Yes, this seems like a good idea. Can you tell me more, please? You have your own room, and the fee covers breakfast and dinner during weekdays, with lunch included at the weekends. I can send you more details through the post or by email. I'm living with a friend at the moment. Can you post it to me at her address? Yes, that's possible. I can do it for you today. That's fine. Thank you. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 6 to 10. Before I send you the information, I need your address details and some personal information. Can I have your family name, please? Yes, it's Lee. Is that L double E? No, it's L I. And your first name? It's Mike, spelt M I K E. What nationality are you? I'm a British born Chinese. Okay, can I have your current address, please? Yes, it's 108 Archer Park, Middleton, Manchester. And the postcode, please? It's M247AB. And your telephone number? Yes, it's 0161 343 651. Now, there are eight possible homestay providers near the English Language School, but they might not all be suitable. I need to check your preferences. Do you smoke? No, I don't. So, I'd like a non-smoking home, please. Do you have a special diet? Are you vegetarian, for example? I eat meat, but not fish. And do you have any medical conditions? 
No, I have no health problems. What about family pets? Do you like cats and dogs? Well, I like cats, but not dogs. Okay, there's just one more thing. Do you want a room with your own private bathroom? This might cost a little bit extra. I would prefer it as long as it's not too much more. Well, we have a couple of providers that are suitable for you. I'll post the information out today. Please contact this office as soon as you've made your decision. Otherwise, you might find that your room has been taken. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2. You will hear a resident student showing a group of new students around the campus on an open day. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Good morning everyone and thank you for attending today's open day at the International Student Centre or ISC building. I'm John, one of the college's resident students. We'll be making a brief tour of the campus first. Please feel free to ask questions as we walk along and I'll do my best to answer them. Now, from where we are standing, you can see the Arts Centre. It's the circular building directly opposite. The centre is open to both students and the public. There are weekly classes in drawing and painting, music and drama, also photography and ceramics. Directly behind the Arts Centre is the Sports Hall, which houses a fitness room, badminton courts, showers and a steam room. Once again, these facilities are open to the public, though a charge is made if you don't have a sports card. Next to the Arts Centre, a little way up the road is the Reed Dining Room with its adjoining cafe. The Reed Dining Room is named after Dr. John Reed, that's R -E, e D, the last principal of the college. OK, let's take a stroll along Campus Road. This is a pedestrians only road, so there's no need to worry about cars. I'll say a bit more about cars later. The first building, here on your left, is the Information Services Building, which houses the main library, IT services, and also a media room. Notice the covered walkway to keep you dry when walking between the Information Services and ISC buildings. Right, let's continue along Campus Road a little bit more. Just coming up on the right is the Students' Union Building and Bar, and behind it, though you can't see it from here, is the Union Shop. Here you can buy stationery items, second-hand books and university merchandise. The Union Shop will also buy second-hand books from students. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 16 to 20.
Any questions so far? No? Right, in that case, let's carry on. Now, please keep out of the cycle lane as we walk around the corner. Okay, we can stop here for a minute. The car park on the left houses a covered bicycle park. You can use the car park and the bicycle racks, but you do need a permit. These are available from the Hospitality Services Office, which can be found in the Students' Union building. There are a limited number of spaces, and permits are issued on a first-come, first-served basis. The access to the car park is from Campus Road on foot, but the entrance for cars is from North Road. For students arriving by bus, the nearest bus stop is in the North Road, just past the start of Campus Road. A bus stops here every 10 minutes between 8 o'clock and half past 9, Monday to Friday. Outside of these hours, a bus stops on North Road every 30 minutes between 10 o'clock and 6 p.m. Next, I'd just like to draw your attention to the Education Centre over to your right, opposite the bike shed. Most of your lectures will be held in the ISC building, but some will be delivered in the Education Centre. Behind the Education Centre, there are two halls of residence. These are both self catering. Moore Hall is over to the left, but you can't see it from here. Oh, sorry, that's wrong. It's Hepworth Hall to the left. The hall was named after Barbara Hepworth, a contemporary of Moore. Hepworth is spelt H E P W O R T H. Moore Hall is the building that sticks out on the right. It was named after the famous English artist and sculptor Sir Henry Moore. More is spelt M double O R E. Well, thank you for your attention this morning. We'll now return to the ISC building for refreshments, when I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two. Part 3. You will hear an interview with a professor talking about numeracy skills. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Good morning, we're pleased to welcome Professor Lewis Counter from the European Numeracy Centre, who has come here today to talk about Numeracy Week. Professor Counter, I'd like to start by asking, what is Numeracy Week and who is it aimed at? Is it mostly for young people or adults? Well, Numeracy Week is part of a strategy to improve mathematical skills throughout the European Union. It aims to raise awareness that improving your numeracy can be a rewarding experience for people of all ages, not just one particular age group. Oh, I see. And why are mathematical skills so important in today's society? A lack of numerical skill prevents people from applying for better paid jobs, or from retraining, or perhaps from entering higher education. What's more, there's a knock-on effect on future generations when parents are unable to assist their children with maths homework. A relationship exists between success in the classroom and parental input at home. So what is the main message you would like to send out to people who have difficulties with numbers? Well, people shouldn't feel embarrassed about their lack of mathematical knowledge. It's a widespread problem, as in fact is literacy. 
I would like to see more people enrolling on numeracy courses, no matter how poor someone perceives his or her numeracy to be. And what are the key skills covered in these types of classes? Well, in the past, classes tended to focus on basic arithmetic skills without sufficient real-life context. Today, we like to view numeracy from a vocational perspective. That's to say, in relation to the type of work you do. Of course, number skills remain useful in a general way as well. For example, with financial transactions, such as paying for goods and checking the change you receive or working out the savings to be made on sale items, as well as budgeting for things like vacations, so that you don't get into debt. Well, yes, I can see the benefits of all those things. And can you tell me the main reasons why people attend numeracy classes? Well, each individual will have their own personal reasons, and these can differ widely from person to person. I realise that. Do you think that people are looking to fill in the gaps in their education left by a poor performance at school? Yes, that can be the case. Some people return to the classroom to prove to themselves that they can be successful academically, whilst others want to pass an exam that they failed previously. The sense of achievement helps to build confidence and self-esteem. Well, it seems that people have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Thank you, Professor. Before you hear the rest of the interview, you have some time to read questions 26 to 30. Did you catch that question, Professor? One of our listeners would like to know more about the numeracy curriculum. Well, the elements of numeracy are the same worldwide. As a first step, it's essential to memorise the multiplication tables. Hasn't the electronic calculator taken over most of this work, Professor? It's true that electronic calculators can do many calculations quickly but mental arithmetic remains a key skill. You can't use a calculator to cancel fractions, for example. No, uh, that's true. And what about the metric system, as we're part of Europe? Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. It's vital for people to get to grips with the metric system of measurement, which must be included in any curriculum. And what about the workplace? You mentioned a vocational perspective earlier. That's right. Some employees need to read information from graphs and charts or from tables, and it's quite common to have to record measurements and take readings at work. Some people struggle to read instrument dials properly. This could create a problem if you wanted a job with the postal service, for example, where you might need to weigh items on a scale or balance. And I guess there are many other jobs and careers where numeracy skills are vital. So much so that many employers insist on testing numeracy skills as a means of screening out unsuitable candidates. I see, yes, as part of shortlisting. Well, thank you once again, Professor. There's plenty for our listeners to think about. That is the end of Part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers to Part 3. Listening, Part 4. You will hear a climatologist talking about tropical storms and the hurricane naming system. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Hi, I'm Dr. Scott Stormwell, and I'm going to talk briefly about hurricanes and tornadoes. I'll be covering how and where they form. Then I'll move on to describe the hurricane naming system. By that, I mean the use of male and female first names, like Hurricane Calvin or Hurricane Julia. And whilst we're on the subject of names, I'll also be explaining the differences between names like cyclone, hurricane, typhoon, tornado, and twister. Some of these names are used interchangeably to refer to the same phenomena, which can lead to confusion. But I'll be keeping to the strict meteorological definitions. Okay, a twister is the informal name for a tornado, so that's easy. A tornado is a relatively small column of violently rotating air formed over land during a severe thunderstorm. The majority of tornadoes are less than 200 meters in diameter and they spin with high wind speeds, typically up to 200 miles per hour. That's 300 kilometers per hour, which makes them very destructive. The tornado or twister forms inside thick storm clouds when warm air rising from the ground is forced to spin as it hits cold, fast moving air from above. If the tornado forms over water, for example a lake or the sea, it becomes a water spout. Tornadoes can form in any part of the world, but they occur most frequently over flat areas in America, typically in the central and southern states, reducing in number towards the eastern seaboard. The western half of America is rarely affected, so the worst affected states tend to be Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, and Kentucky, down to Texas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, but not exclusively these places. Right, let's move on to cyclones. These are massive, several hundred miles in diameter, sometimes over 1,000 kilometers. Cyclones form over warm seas, typically above 25 degrees C, as the warm, moist air from the ocean evaporates, it rises to create an area of low pressure beneath. This depression drags in the surrounding air, which then swirls in the same direction as the Earth rotates. Speeds are usually lower than those in tornadoes, but they can still build to 150 miles per hour or 240 kilometers, sufficient to wreak tremendous damage when the cyclone reaches land, where it eventually dies out. The center of the storm contains a calm region, the eye of the cyclone, which can be tens of kilometers wide. So what about hurricanes and typhoons? Well, this is straightforward. Cyclones, hurricanes, and typhoons describe the same type of cyclonic storm. However, the word cyclone tends to be used with storms that form below the equator of the Earth, whereas hurricanes and typhoons are cyclones that form above the equator. Typhoon is the favored term in Asia and hurricane in America. Right, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that I'd be looking into the hurricane naming system, so that's what I'd like to do now. You've probably all heard names like Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Andrew because these hurricanes were two of America's largest natural disasters. But how did the naming system originate and how were the names chosen? Before I go into this, I need to make a distinction between a tropical storm and a tropical cyclone or hurricane. A tropical storm is referred to as a hurricane when the storm achieves a sustained wind speed in excess of 40 miles per hour. That's 65 kilometers per hour. It's the tropical storm that's given a name first. So, for example, Tropical Storm William becomes Hurricane William if its speed exceeds 40 miles per hour. There's no Hurricane William if the tropical storm dissipates before it reaches 40 miles per hour. Now, in the early days of weather forecasting, by that I mean pre-1940, hurricanes weren't usually named. Forecasts simply referred to the storm in terms of its position, 
i.e. latitude and longitude. However, this became problematic as a means of tracking individual hurricanes, so the most severe hurricanes were given names, though not in any systematic way. Initially, names were chosen at random, or they might reflect the name of a place in the vicinity of the storm. The current official naming system originated in America in 1945 and was first applied to storms within the Western Pacific Ocean. Only female names were chosen until 1979, similar to the naming of boats and ships, after which time male and female names were alternated. Today, there are official lists of names for most of the world's oceans. In most cases, at least 20 names per ocean per year are made available. The names are placed in alphabetical order, so the first tropical storm of the season will start with the letter A, and the next storm will have a name starting with the letter B, and so on. Complete sets of names are drawn up to cover several years of storms, after which time the names can be recycled. One final thing. The names of Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Andrew will never appear again. The name of any destructive hurricane is always retired from the list of names. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.